Good morning. Uh, hearing Takashi uh, speak, I'm reminded of uh, my sensei Shin, um, who used to say um, before a ma major presentation, remember Pascal son, think before you speak. And I'd say, thank you for wisdom, Shin san. So, um, I'd like to begin with a quote uh, from a Stoic philosopher, uh, Epictetus, which I think is, is um, germane. It is difficulty which shows what uh, people are. Therefore, when a difficulty befalls you, remember that God, like a trainer of wrestlers, has matched you with a rough young opponent. For what purpose, you may ask? Why, so that you may become a wrestling champion. <laughs> now, what does this have to do with um, our conference today? Well, first of all, um, you as leaders uh, need to frame reality. So uh, Epictetus faced great difficulty in his life. He framed it in a very compelling way. You too have to frame the challenges your organizations are facing in such a way that people are pulled into the future. It's a pull system, really. Um, secondly, good companies prosper in hard times. Um, uh, Toyota in 1950 was almost bankrupt. Um, in the early 90s, Caterpillar and IBM were in catastrophic shape. Um, the late 90s, Procter & Gamble was facing very serious difficulties, and they used the difficulty to, uh, to spur them on to improve. So uh, as Dan pointed out earlier uh, this morning, we have a chance to use our current difficulties in a very profitable way to get much stronger. Now, too often, planning comprises uh, this. Have you had the experience where smart, capable people uh, in a room uh, develop, have developed a strategy which comprises 50, 70, 100 slides, and in our gut we know they don't have a lot of meaning, and nothing will come of this, but we do it every year, so we'll just keep doing it. What's the thinking that underlies this picture? Well, uh, first of all, complexity is profound. It must, be, it must be important. There are 100 slides, and the, the font is very small, and there are confusing graphics. It must be important. Lean thinking, as Dan pointed out, takes the opposite approach. Simplicity marks the end of a process of refining. Complexity is a crude state. The second mental model this reflects is more is more. Let's press all the buttons. Something is bound to happen. <sighs> um, lean thinking is less is more. What are the top three? As Takashi said, what are the top three? As we'll see, that takes great skill and great insight. And uh, the third mental model this reflects is planning means looking at screens with lots of data on them as opposed to Go see for yourself, of course, understand the data. Engage your left brain, but also engage your right brain. Go and see. Go to the Gemba, the real place, uh, the lab, the loading dock, the uh, design factory, the uh, customer site. What do you see? What do you see on the loading dock? I see um, 50 forklift trucks, and only two of them are moving and adding value. I see um, tons of finished goods inventory. I see people uh, wandering around aimlessly. Oh, okay, what does that mean? Okay. Now, the foundation of uh, strategy deployment is the scientific method. And uh, as Jim said, um, we don't reject hypotheses in management, whereas in science, we almost always do. So what does that mean? Um, it means we don't grasp the situation. And that means not just analyzing. We have to engage our left brain, as I said, but it also means engaging our right brain by going to see and by um, this uh, 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 knowledge, tacit knowledge you develop through continuous experimentation. And then you can answer difficult questions, the searching questions, such as, what is the nature of my division. What is the nature of this site? What is the character of this team? 
those are not necessarily um, measurable, but they are just as important. So grasping the situation means left brain and right brain. And the result of that, hopefully, is a compelling story. Strategy is storytelling. And that's one of the ways you engage people and pull them into the future. So the obstacle here is not grasping the situation, accepting the confusing PowerPoint as, well, it's, it is what it is. We always do this. Let's just get it over with. Now, a related image is, um, is this here, which expresses a powerful idea that the DNA of strategy deployment of the lean system is the scientific method and that that DNA is replicated at smaller and smaller levels of magnification. So in chaos theory, they talk about broccoli as being an example of a fra fractal. If I had a stick of broccoli here, what would it look like? Broccoli. If I cut a flowerlet off and magnified it five times, what would it look like? Why, it still looks like broccoli. If I took a sliver off the flowerlet, magnified that ten times, the same pattern would emerge. So this slide here shows business activities on the top half, business planning, activity planning and so on, right down to daily work, and the bottom half is tools. But the fractal, the driving force is the scientific method. Now, what's this got to do with you? Leaders have to be able to see this fractal at different levels. They have to be able to zoom in to the point Kaizen level, maybe a process improvement in a hospital in admitting we need to reduce cycle time by X percent, or zoom out to a design process. We need to reduce the cycle time on prototyping by this much or zoom out even further to the strategy deployment level and see and understand this cost gap in a very real way. So uh, the obstacle here is um, executives don't see this, they don't understand this, and they don't understand their role is to develop people's capability to apply the scientific method. In our practice, what we do with executives is help them through each level of the fractal. We start right at the most granular level. What is waste? How can you understand delay or scrap or over-processing in a visceral way? Then zoom out to the next level. What is point Kaizen? How do we take one point in our insurance company and reduce error rates? Zoom out to the next level. What is flow Kaizen? How do we link five point Kaizen so there's an overall um, uh, uh, benefit and breakthrough in a given value stream. Next one is system Kaizen. So within our, our factory, our hospital, our bank, what is the character of our people system, of our uh, um, uh, machine system, of our material system? And where are the weak spots? And what are the three things that matter? And the broadest magnification is enterprise Kaizen, where you see your entire company and upstream and downstream, suppliers, customers, and then you're able to make hypotheses that have some guts, that have a chance to succeed. So the obstacle here is not seeing this, not understanding this. So as I said, I'm going to take you through the strategy deployment process and identify obstacles at each uh, step. As Takashi said, it's very difficult. There are a lot of rabbit holes you could fall into, but if we have a map, we can avoid them. So. Plan means telling in interesting stories, and our uh, currency is, as Jim said, the A3, which is a storyboard on one page, and uh, we call it A3 thinking. The point is not the piece of paper. The point is we are able to grasp the situation through this um, uh, intense involvement in the gamba and this intense reflection, this hansei, uh, that uh, Takashi described, so that we have a profound knowledge of our zone. The zone might be quality or people or it might be innovation. And thereby we're able to develop hypotheses that matter. And the relevant metaphor here is chess. I saw an interview with um, 
uh, on CNN, with Garry Kasparov, the, uh, arguably the greatest chess player in history. And Wolf was asking him uh, about his um, activities in Russia. He's leading the pro-democracy forces. Had a very, very brave guy, brilliant guy. And afterward, uh, Wolf uh, spoke with a chess journalist, and he asked, what made Kasparov so special? And the journalist said, no matter how confusing the situation on the chessboard, no matter how tense the tournament situation, or how tired or exhausted or um, emotional or upset he was, he could always find the three things that mattered. And that's the key to strategy deployment. What are the three things that matter? It's about emphasis. We understand we have to do 50 things. There is routine work, we must make the numbers, but strategy is about identifying what to emphasize. And this invariably is a process of condensing, 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 not a hundred slides, but one piece of paper. I think of, um, of Einstein, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for a paper on the photoelectric effect. Anybody know how many pages it was? It's three pages. <laughs> It's 10 years working in the Swiss pa patent office and thinking about it, thinking about it, and then he wrote it and condensed it. It's an expression of what we're talking about. So how do we develop the plan? Here's the, um, the process very quickly. Step one, we have to define the problem. That's extremely hard to do. As Jim said in his talk, I would think about things for half an hour, and then I'd realize we were asking the wrong question. <sighs> so what business need are we trying to, uh, to fill? That's, that's a hard question. Second step. Why can't we close that gap? And I've shown a fishbone diagram here that is one of many tools we might use. Analytical tools like fishbones, value stream maps are invaluable, of course, spaghetti diagrams, what have you, and also that go-see, that intuitive tacit knowledge gained by, 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 by sensing the atmosphere in those places I described. Once we've done that, we're in a position, hopefully, to identify the top three, like Gary Kasparov. And then we can make a hypothesis that hopefully has um, some guts. The left-hand side of the paper is our grasp of the situation. The, the right-hand side is our hypothesis. And as Dan said earlier, we're running experiments. Every annual PDCA cycle, every weekly PDCA check adjust is uh, uh, part of the experiment, experimental process. And probably our hypotheses will prove unsound. doesn't matter. We've learned a tremendous amount. We'll continue to refine. We'll just keep getting better and better and better and better. Now, the uh, obstacles here. The first one is not defining the problem correctly, as I said. Uh, second one is jumping from one to four. One, four, one, four, one, four, one, four. Um, yeah, third one is um, not focusing on those top three, but having 20 things on, on the paper, as I said. Let's press all the buttons and hope for the best. Now, here's a very quick image of how an A3 expresses this uh, uh, picture. Top left corner is what problem are we trying to solve? Middle box on the left is what is our reflection on last year's activities? What does our gut tell us? What does the data tell us? And hopefully it's focused data, not 50 KPRs. Step three, what is our grasp of the situation. Based on this business need, based on this reflection, what do we need to do? What does our instinct tell us? If we zoom out and see the entire chessboard, what must we do? The action plan on the right reflects, uh, the, the right hand side rather, reflects how we will implement our hypothesis. And the bottom right corner is what might go wrong and how we'll handle it. And we know things will always go wrong. No plan goes according to plan. The purpose of the plan is to tell us when we're off the plan. Again, we're running experiments. Now, the next step is, once we've defined the plan, is to deploy the plan. And that entails translating level by level. So each section looks at true north, what we're trying to achieve, looks at our mother A3s, as we call them, and say, okay, now what can I do to support? What are the things that we can emphasize in our part of the battlefield, if I can use that metaphor? So we ask questions, as uh, several speakers mentioned. We apply the Socratic method. We ask questions, what do you think? On what is that based? What assumptions have you made? What if those assumptions weren't true? Do you think we're at root cause here? How might you test? 
how might we pilot this hypothesis so we don't roll it out across the company at great cost and then find it's ineffective? So thereby we translate level by level and we have a tree of um, necessary and sufficient activities in the ideal condition through this process we call catch ball. So let's have a look at what this tree looks like. So we begin with our definition of true north. What are we trying to achieve? Now answering that question uh, entails answering some precursor questions. Who are we? If you asked Kodak 15 years ago, they might have said we're a film company. If they answered it today, they'd probably say we're an imaging company. It's fundamentally different. What do we believe in? Now, why is that important? Because if you don't understand who you are and what you believe in, you will lack constancy of purpose. You'll lack that ability to ride out the highs and the lows, that tenacity year after year after year after year after year, we're going to get better. You break a hockey stick over my head, I'm going to smile at you and say, we're still going. Right? That kind of image. If you don't understand your values and who you are, you can't sustain. Now, the second level here is our mother A3s. And as we'll see, we have key thinkers who develop hypotheses around our focus areas. Now, here comes the translation. The next level, let's say it's general manager level, entails looking at the key thinkers' policies or strategies and figuring out what does it mean for us. It's translation. It's not Soviet-style proliferation. This is a tree that is necessary and sufficient. It's not a mangrove with a gazillion things to do. Each level, as you can see, translates so that at the front line, each person, each section has a couple of things that they'll work on, a few things to emphasize. Okay? And obviously the uh, uh, failure mode here is not doing the translation, is allowing this mangrove to proliferate. And the syndrome I see a lot is you pretend to give us a meaningful plan, we'll pretend to implement it. Now, in order for um, this process of translation to happen, and in order for us to have meaningful hypotheses, we need something called a deployment leader. Uh, Toyota, they call it a chief engineer. Um, I like the term key thinker. Um, breakthrough requires cross-functionality. It is a lateral process, as Jim showed. It's not a vertical process. Um, in any industry, if we want to reduce lead time in a hospital, we've got to have alignment from all the um, uh, sections in that pathway that the patient follows. In, um, in manufacturing or uh, construction, we're making houses. If we want to break through in water leaks, we've got to have alignment, people doing the foundation, people putting in the blocks, people putting in the frame, people putting in the windows, people putting in the trim. Breakthrough is inevitably cross-functional and unit efficiency does not equal overall efficiency. Therefore, we need these folks we call key thinkers. And uh, again, they develop the hypotheses. They play the role of Kasparov, if you will, in our organization and identify the three things that matter. Here are some of the qualities they must have. Uh, there's um, uh, a wonderful scene in Lawrence of Arabia. Have you seen that movie? Where uh, they're going across the anvil of the sun and uh, it's this terrible desert and they get through it and discover that one of their party has fallen off his camel and, and everyone says, well, he's going to die. It is written, he's going to die. And Lawrence says, no, 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 we can't let him die. And they said, no, it is written, he's going to die. And Lawrence gets on his camel, he goes back into the anvil and he brings him back to great fanfare. And he says, nothing is written. For the deployment leader, nothing is written. Well, our changeovers have always taken four hours. Why not 20 minutes? But our prototype cycle time has always been six months. But we've always designed machines this way, you know, difficult to change over. But we've always designed packaging that way, difficult to change SKUs. We had a, had a fellow say to me um, a few uh, weeks ago, you're giving us permission to challenge how we design products, how we design machines, how we schedule. Exactly. Nothing is written. So, in order to uh, um, develop those hypotheses, clearly profound knowledge 
is uh, required and impatience with the, the status quo. So here are some of the uh, qualities these people must have. The obstacle, again, is not enough key thinkers. I had an uh, executive vice president say to me, this was a, a year-end uh, review, it was uh, not quite two months ago, it was a good result. They'd saved tons of money. Uh, across the board, they'd improved. But he was um, very reflective, and he said, you know, we do not have enough key thinkers. So he's starting to understand just what the potential is and how much money they left on the table, how much lead time they could have saved, and so on. So his impatience is a very good sign. Now, third step is uh, the check phase, wherein we make problems visible. And check entails a number of qualities. Key point to answer is what are the hot spots and what are we doing about them? And the mental model here that problems are gold and our check process needs to make them visible. The um, obstacles here, First of all, not recognizing that this is the most common failure mode in enterprise PDCA. And in getting the right things done, I call check the ugly duckling. We think it's a trivial job, but PDCA fails most commonly in checking. Secondly, checking is a part of your standardized work as a leader. So what's the purpose? What's the process? What's the expected outcome? What's the timing? that comprises your check process. So if you have good answers to those questions and to Takashi's question, then your meetings will be effective. We'll identify hotspots, we will uh, talk about what's important. We may not get to root cause, but we're way ahead of the game. So the relevant image is uh, a series of gears. Just very quickly, um, the uh, site check adjust meeting informs and drives the department check adjust meeting, which does the same for the section meeting which might be at a team board in the, uh, in the pharmacy at the beginning of the day. What happened yesterday? What did we learn? What's in the pipeline for today? Heads up and so on. Similarly, um, leader standard work comprises layered checking. That fractal image, my Gemba time is structured. I'm looking for um, how we might improve our material system. What is the quality of our uh, machine system. So I'm zooming out and zooming in thereby. Now adjust means problem solving. Here's how problems are distributed in most companies. A few big ugly ones. More um, medium sized ones and then many many small ones. Strategy deployment entails creating this image here. What are the two or three things we'll focus on? Like Kasparov. What Kaizen activities, action plans do we need? And what will be our emphasis on the front line? The obvious obstacles here are not enough problem solvers. We don't develop that capability. We haven't thought as leaders that my job is to develop capability. By the way, I, I would paraphrase um, uh, Jim's earlier comment. Um, a, a leader's job is A, to deliver business results, B, to de develop capability, machine capability, process capability and people capability, and third, to reinforce values. The latter because without that, you lack constancy of purpose. So uh, failure modes, not enough problem solvers, not enough key thinkers, so we don't identify the two or three things that are important. Uh, quick summary, what are some of the obstacles to getting the right things done? Weak hypotheses, root cause, not enough key thinkers, not enough Gemba activity, and not knowing what to look for in the Gemba. Uh, possible countermeasures clearly are self-explanatory. Develop key thinkers, use standard work to make go-see activity more powerful. Too many activities. Root cause, not grasping the situation. So please push back at those strategy meetings. Say, I don't get it. I don't, I don't see the link. I don't think we're at root cause. Third point, we can't sustain the gains. As, as a couple of speakers pointed out, we have buffered our management team with finished goods, or with capacity, or with lead time, expedite. So their muscles might be weak. Sustaining the game is the most difficult thing. So how will we sustain, pe or how will we build people's muscles? Short answer, in the short term we may need a Kaizen promotion office. We certainly need a plan for every person. And um, uh, other obstacle, the team is not engaged. In other words, I don't know what this means for me. You, you, uh, nobody comes to the Gemba, nobody has asked me, what do you think, what's your hypothesis? I, 
I, this is all abstract to me. You're asking me to, to do something. I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, metrics, of course, too many, too complex. And uh, Takeshi talked about um, um, you know, boiling the 50 down to, uh, to three. So um, I'll take two minutes to just summarize a key enabler. One thing that you can do uh, to uh, and a, a good countermeasure to many of these, and it's called leader standard work. Why should you care? Because what you do as a leader is what you get. It's the iron law of management. What you do is what you get. If you are unfocused, if you lack standards, if your process is invisible and so on, that's what you'll get on the front line. And leader standard work entails applying the scientific method to your work. Now, most leaders' work uh, can be grouped as follows. There are four quadrants, one, two, three, and four. The uh, tension, there is tension between two and four, or two and three, rather. Uh, three is urgent, but not important. People yelling this and that. You've got to do something. The firefighting cycle begins. The top, uh, the number two, is where strategy making and system building happens. We have to find time for number two. And that's how, that's where leader standard work is so important. The benefits are that with more system development time, process time, Gemba time, reflection time, we will have fewer fires, which means we have more time to do the above, which means we get into a benevolent cycle as opposed to the vicious cycle uh, so many companies are in. We don't have time for improvement, which means we have more fires, which means we have no time for improvement, which means we have more fires. It just grinds us into the ground. So how do we make up time? There are a number of ways of doing this. Some companies have golden zones, times when you cannot schedule anything. Um, and there are other uh, countermeasures. So um, in, su in summary, uh, these are hard times. But it's hard times that uh, show us what we are. So you have a very profitable difficulty facing you. So how you translate that will determine who you are in five years. So good luck. <laughs>